yummy, yummy fizzy dog pizza roll. <laughs> He's sort of the embodiment of ADHD, you know, spinning around. It's and like walking uh, in monster. Yes, exactly. And you know, having, being, having they didn't have that diagnosis for me when I was a kid, but I sure as hell would have been diagnosed. <laughs> well, thank goodness no one gave you Adderall. Oh, thank goodness, yes. Yes, can you imagine me on Adderall? No, I'd probably still be on it. No, thank you. So anyway, um, so I got that, and, and 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 then when they did the first auditions for the new Spielberg show, Animaniacs. I was lucky enough to be the first person they read on the first day of auditions at 9 a.m. And I was like, I, I'm habitually, it's a not a good thing, but I'm habitually late. Uh, about half the time I'm five minutes late for sessions. Yeah, it's, you know, it's just not, a, it's something I need, I don't know how to correct it. I suppose leave the house five minutes earlier. But, um, yeah, but this time I was 15 minutes early for the audition. And I fought the morning traffic, left my house at 7.30, and, you know, I was there. And they handed me the copy, and I read for Yakko and Wacko, and I read for I read for Squit, and I read for Pesto, and I read for Bobby, and I read for this new character called Brain. And I looked at that picture, and I saw Orson Welles. I mean, that's what I thought. I thought they were like, oh, because I was kind of known for this. Every time there was a mic check, you know, or any kind of thing, I would just do this outtake tape of Orson Welles doing a frozen peas commercial. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so how, how did you, before, before we, let's do a little tangent. Uh, how, how did you doing Orson Welles just start? Where, where did you discover Well, I Orson became Welles first started? fascinated with, it, with him and his voice in 1967, Casino Royale. I mean, the two people that stood out to me from that film were Woody Allen, mm. with the, you know, I mean, I just, I kept repeating that line. Yes, so yes, I endress them and tie them up. Yes, absolutely. And Orson Welles, I'm going to have to have that check, Mr. Bonds. And, and so, 1984, New Year's Eve, I'm on the job from hell. It's a 12-hour session. I missed my New Year's Eve party because of this job. So, uh, Phil Proctor from the Fireside Theater gives me this tape to cheer me up, and it's all celebrity outtakes before that was a thing. And, and so I'm listening to it, and the very first thing on it is this outtake thing, and I'm, I'm playing it backwards and forwards. I mean, every time it starts, I can't believe that the, the, here's Orson Welles being as real as he gets, and he's still this, it sounds like the dialogue is so brilliant, it's written for him by, by, by him, you know, and Mankiewicz. Anyway, um, so it starts like this. We know a remote farm in Lincolnshire where Mrs. Buckley lives. Every July, peas grow there. Do you really mean that? Oh yes, I'd start about a half a second late. Don't you think you really want to say July over the snow? Isn't that the fun of it? Well, if you could make it almost when that child disappears, also you make much more. I think it's so nice that you see the snow-covered fields every July, peas grow there. We know a remote farm in Lincolnshire where Mrs. Buckley lives. Every July, peas grow there. We aren't even in the fields, you see. No, no, we're not. We're talking about them growing and she's picked them. <clears throat> I don't understand you then. What must be over for July? When we get out of that snowy field. Well, I was out. We were onto a can of peas, a big dish of peas when I say July. You are? Yes, always. I'm always past that. That's about when you say July. Uh, could you emphasize a bit in, in July? Why, that doesn't make any sense. <laughs> Sorry, there's no known way of saying an English sentence in which you begin a sentence within and emphasize it. Get me a jury and show me how you can say in July and I'll go down on you. It's just idiotic if you'll forgive me for my saying so. It's just stupid. In July. Love to know how you emphasize in and in July. Impossible. <laughs> Meaningless. I think all they were thinking about was they didn't want... He isn't thinking. Also, we have one last one. It was my fault. I said in July. If you could leave every July. You didn't say it. He said it. Your friend. <laughs> anyway, I won't do the whole thing. Well, it's amazing you remember, you remember all of that. Oh, I can do it. I can do it in the end, but it gets a little, it gets a little dirty. So, so okay, let's <laughs> get, getting back to uh, Animaniacs. As if it didn't already become a little dirty. And Sorry. Although, Trigger warning, Orson Welles swears. And, and so we, we already don't know the Orson Welles slash brain voice. So let's, let's talk about some of those other roles that you've played on well, they, they, they By the way, so based on that, based on my looking at brain and his furrowed brow and his jowly cheeks, 
I think Orson Welles. They do not have Orson Welles in mind. There's a writer named Tom Minchin. If you look him up on the uh, on, on on IMDb, you'll see that's the brain's face as a human being. And he used to write with Tom Ruger at Hanna Barbera, and was writing on Animaniacs. And that's who he was based on. And Tom Minton is is a genius. Uh, he's one, but he's, he talks in a very monotone way. Everything does is very fast. Because move his mind moves so fast, but he's got a wealth of knowledge that's unbelievable. And if I'd have done that, I think they would have gone next. But they booked me right on the spot. Ruger and Andrea Romano just said, that's it, we found brain. Okay, no more brains today. Which is a shame because I know that they had John Delancey on the list to read for brain. I know, I know, I found out later that Delancey was like gonna be the next, the next person to read for brain. And they just told him not to bother. But you know, they, they booked me sign up, right on that, right at that point for, for, for brain. And it took them two days to find Pinky, my dear friend Rob Paulson. Yeah. But at the end of day one, the, 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 the front runner for Pinky was John Aston, TV's Gomez from the Adams Family. Oh my! Isn't that been fun? That could have been fun. I mean, I, I mean, I love it. I love that it's Rob, but John is just you know just amazing. So, okay. So, what? Uh, just for just for just to remind the crowd, who are some of your other famous voices? Oh, I played well. I played Squid the Pigeon in The Good Feathers, the Ray Liotta Pigeon. As far back as I can remember, I always wanted to be a good feather. And uh, I played, oh, I played a lot of the the, uh, the, the nemeses of Yakko, Wacko, and Dot. The first one being Michelangelo. What have you done to my beautiful ceiling? They covered it up. It's covered in naked people. We like painting naked people. You know. Uh, <laughs> the Zeppelins is here. Uh, I played, uh, I played uh, Miles Standish as Richard Burton. Oh, my PT pajamas, I loved him so. And uh, <laughs> Willie Slackmer. Will, Willie Slackmer was a take on William Shatner when they're all out for karaoke. karaoke uh, it's called Karaoke Doki, the episode. And I called them my friends, my small friends. <laughs> I'd like to read Lucy in the Sky with diamonds. The so. <laughs> spoken word album. Oh my God. She oh. packed my bags last night. Brief flight. Zero hour. Not him. And I'm going to be. In, a, in, in case guided you, by them. In case any of you don't know about this, there is actually, so help me God. Oh my God, yes. A musical album that you can find if you look hard enough called The Transport. In, uh, in, 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 in the last 10, 15 years, still all talk singing stuff, but you know, it, it, I think it was nominated for a Grammy. I'm convinced Shatner's a genius. I really am. I, first of all, his genius was when, when, when the tape, when the outtake tape of him came out, of him berating uh, a guy doing the, uh, directing him in a Star Trek game, I don't say sabotage. You say sabotage. I say sabotage. Spock sabotaged the system. You know, that, that, that thing. Ah, uh, please don't tell me how to do it. It sickens me. Um, being confronted with that on the Howard Stern show, he got that, that 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 he should be in on the joke instead of pushing against it. He embraced it and embraced the character of him and stopped taking himself so seriously. And I think that started the second resurgence of his career. Mm -hmm. No, I think I, I I'm convinced Shat's a genius. Right on. So, okay, so Shat yeah. is a genius, and I am insane. So, who else did you do on Animaniacs? Yeah. Yeah. So you were a ton of the voices on this. I did. I was. I'm, I'm, let's see. Let's run down. Uh, God, I mean, they had so much for me in there. Um, oh, 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 do you know any? Is there one you're thinking of? You realize I'm completely blanking. Okay. All right. So am I. <laughs> I'm, 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 I. Well, I'm, that's fine. Let's I'm not going to remember my resume. Let's just go to Pinky in the Brain. All right. You want guys want to go to Pinky in the Brain? Yeah. Okay. okay. I think, I think we're happy with that. Me too. Me too. Pinky and the Brain, we did the, we did the first episode that we recorded was uh, the, the one with Jeopardy, the one where they're on Jeopardy. <laughs> and something about doing that show with just me and Rob in the room, uh, we, we went through it. We, 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 we kind of hit the notes of that, you know, that Pinky's the annoying one and Brain's the slow burn one and, and all that. And it was, there was something that we, we, we didn't know it was magic. We didn't know it would be a hit. But at the end of the episode, we just went, 
That's one of the smartest things we've ever read. I love these guys. I hope they come back. You know, do you think they'll be back? I hope so. Gosh, let's do those guys again. Because Animaniacs at the beginning was just, just seeing, you know, taking spaghetti noodles and throwing them against the fridge to see which ones would stick. They had so many things that they did. And, um, you know, like Katie Kaboom didn't last. Katie Kaboom that's was, true, you know, a, a pay into, now. you know, t uh, teen angst. And, uh, it, you know, they made three of them or four of them and went, okay, it's not for Katie Kaboom. We get the point. Teenage girls exploded their parents. Um, you know, but, but Pinky and the Brain came back and back and back. And the, 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 the plots that take over the world got zanier and, you know, less and less realistic. But they realized what they had there was the story of a friendship. And dare, dare I say a bromance? A bromance indeed. A brain man. A, ten, a brain man. A brain man. A very tender brain man. It certainly was. Uh, and, and they realized that that's, that's, it's not the plots that take over the world. They can be as zany as they want. People are tuning in because Pinky and the Brain love each other. And Pinky has no trouble showing it, but Brain wouldn't show it unless it was going to save Pinky's life. And there's a couple of instances where Big Brain does, you know, and Pinky does. And that's what we're watching. We're watching and that. Even at the cost of, of, the, of the plot. Of the plot to take over the world. Yeah. He, he will abandon a plot to take over the world. It means that Pinky, that something bad will happen to Pinky. Um, so, you know, that was the magic of Pinky and the Brain. And we watched that. So it is, it's kind of like its own friendship is magic thing. <laughs> you know, or magic is friendship. Uh, but that's what that's what made it so great for us. And Rob Paulson and I, uh, as it was an extension of that, become the dearest of friends. You know, we're still, even after you know after the show ended, we still stayed in touch. We still we still grabbed lunch. And uh, you know that chemistry is obvious. Every time I see an interview with you two or an appearance with you two, it's it's plain to see that you two are more than just work. Colleagues. Oh, I love the man. I love the man. And we we probably text or call each other three times. See, I was dying. And they got you for the show, and they didn't get Paulson. And I was like, I only get to book Maurice. Not that I, okay, wouldn't that have that's, been great? That's not, that's not make it sound like oh, only Maurice. Like, well, Rob, I think Rob was in. Uh, he had a, he guessed it a couple times on the. <laughs> <laughs> no, Rarity's dad was. Uh, oh God, that, that was like one of the uh, like Drummond or somebody. Peter knew. Peter knew. Peter knew. Peter knew. All right. Well, I know Rob did something on on Pony because I told him I was old Pony. Old, old Pony on old Pony. Yes. Oh, so it's kind of Mendel. What's your point? All right. I knew it. Anyway. So he couldn't come to this. So uh, anyway, but but yeah, I would I would love that. I would I would love that. So it wasn't one of the episodes where uh, there was some kind of accident involving a microwave and non dairy. And non dairy creamer because nobody knows how a microwave works or or either one of those works and then it comes out later in the episode. Yeah, everybody knows how they work. But not both of them together. But not both of them together. Indeed. <laughs> Yeah, we got our, that was our first primetime episode. We got, we got, we got spun off to Sunday nights. They figured we'd be competition for The Simpsons. Unfortunately, they didn't put us up opposite The Simpsons. They put us up, put us opposite uh, uh, this little show that never go, never went anywhere called 60 Minutes. Yeah. <laughs> Ratings powerhouse, 60 Minutes. It still wins Sunday nights all these years later. <laughs> I'm Morley Safer. <laughs> I am the brain. And I'm over on the WB. Watch me there. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, so there, there, have been many, there have been shows where you've been a lot of the characters. One of which I think is dear to many people's hearts in this room is Futurama, where, you know, any, any, you know, any voice that isn't Billy West or Bender, is, <laughs> any male voice that isn't those two is pretty much you, right? Uh, I did take Just the majority male. of the male guest voices on the show. I mean, you are, after all, the master of the dramatic... Buzz Calculum, <laughs> the star of all my circuits and owner of unholy acting talent! <laughs> and I'm also more bow the newscaster. In fact, when your president came out with his little theory about Windmills causing cancer, I screamed. Windmills do not work that way at my television set. <laughs> and your good friend, Richard Nixon. Oh, and my dear friend, Richard Nixon, yeah. Uh, weren't you a high potentate of some sort on the show? Oh. A king? Or the, uh... Oh, you mean, uh, Lur, ruler of the planet Omicron Percy I.A.? Yeah, yeah, that's the guy. <laughs> Who sounds nothing like Morbo, as you can not hear. <laughs> Here is Morbo. 
And here's Lur, ruler of the planet Omicron, Percy I-8. Totally different guys. Well, I think Morbo's more aggressive, and Lur is more of a doofus. I mean, Lur is hapless, and, and Lur is, I think he's just a slight bit higher in pitch, just a little bit. Mm -hmm. Morbo is very stentorian, because he does the news, so he must pronounce every word correctly. And so, you know, and, and Lur wants to eat people, Morbo wants to conquer them. Oh, Lieutenant Kif Croker, yes, I feel so sorry for him. He has to shave, he has to manscape Zab Brannigan. Oh my gosh. <laughs> well, I imagine, of course, that's a voice that's very different from these, these bombastic ones. Yes, no, no, I mean, they, we, I go all over the spectrum with, with, uh, with Futurama. But, you know, there's all sort of Don Bot. <laughs> Let me mafia things up a little bit for you over here. Clamps? Give him the clamps. You want the clamps, boss? I'll give him the clamps. I'll clamp every single one of these. Clamp after that. Hey, the personal favorite of mine is hedonism by. Oh, my. <laughs> do you know it's impossible for me to do hedonism by without doing this? I am not The surprised. engineer constantly has to go out and move the microphone. And he's a very handsome young man. <laughs> Or for that matter, he's done some very notable uh, secondary voices on Rick and Morty, quite the popular show. Gentlemen, gentlemen, there's a solution here you're not seeing. Yeah. <laughs> Little, uh, permit me to, permit me to emancipate you from your own inferior genes. Yeah. Abra Dolph Linkler. Abra Dolph Linkler. Abra Dolph Linkler. Oh, we, we love, we love Linkler. I was just into it at Rick and Morty. Uh, last week, and because uh, we're working on our, we're working on the next season. That I can't tell you about. I can't tell you about it, unfortunately. But we were just Justin and I were just talking about how can we bring back Linkler? We got to get Linkler. We got to give him his own episode. He's, him and that random kid that he went off to that planet with. And it's like we, we just the love for Linkler in the writers' room is so great, and yet these people are so precise in their writing, it's paying so much attention to story. It's got to make sense. They can't do fan service even if they themselves are the fans. So right now, there's, there's no way they can figure out they're going to bring back Linkler. But they hope by the end of their 78 episode order, they figure out some way that makes sense for Linkler to come back. I have to say, when Maurice was telling me this when we were doing our interview, our interview prep, I just launched into this rant. Oh my God, they've got the whole multiverse to work with. They, of course they can bring Linkler back. I was like, Arr! I was practically ready to go running out and find Justin Roiland and Dan Harmon and just like, no, do it. it. It's got to make sense. It's got to be. It's got to be. Something oh, what, what about uh, dear or or Marty Junior? Oh, Marty Junior. Oh. It was it was not an easy time, but yes, I basically for Marty Junior, I just did me, you know, <laughs> thinking back on my childhood. Very sad, you. Yeah. Sad me, yes. But there was dancing. There, there was dancing. That, but he want, you know, it's funny. Justin is always looking for very for for a cartoon that's so bizarre. Justin wants always wants me to keep it real. So you'll notice there's not these big variations in the voice. You know, it's it's very it's very much still me, just different aspects of me. So when I play a general, I'm very authoritarian. But uh, you know, but otherwise, I'm very. Uh, it's it's not. I don't do big crazy voices for Justin. Well, there's a voice I've never done before. I've also never done that with my hands before. <laughs> somebody, somebody filmed this that I remember the next time I read for another show. Not a Justin Roiland show, but this is a character I've never done. Holy shit. <laughs> right. You watch me discover a character. Me, Maurice LaMarche. All right, now I'm, I'm only going to do a couple more questions because I know that you guys want to get up to the media. What you were getting yourself into with this bunch. Well, I, you know, I, I, uh, you know, Tara and I are longtime friends. Tara and I actually were, were on, I was on Tara's first U.S. show, Gadget and the Gadget, uh, Gadget Boy and Heather. So Tara played uh, Agent Heather to my baby Gadget until Don decided to do it. And, but I played five other parts in that show. Don so, Adams? Don Adams. That's right. Don Adams played baby Gadget. Gadget Boy. Boy. That missed it by that much. So, uh, so I've known Tara a long time, and so yeah, she told me, you know, just how, you know, how intense the fandom is, and and I think it's really amazing that you guys 
are so dedicated to the show, and it, it speaks to something in your characters as well, the gentleness and the positive message of Pony. So I've always looked at this as a great thing. So I, I've actually, you know, when, when Nicole Dubuque, uh, you know, came on board to write, I said, I actually said to her, I said, I, you know, I wish I could get on Pony. I mean, I just, I would love to go do Oh, so you, you, you actually jumped at the chance. Oh yeah, when she finally had something for me, I was like, I didn't know that she was, you know, talking to me, she was, she was texting me, uh, you know, saying, please call me. And I was like, okay, as soon as I'm done with this session. So it took me a couple of days to get back to her. She thought I wasn't interested. And when I finally got back to her, would you like to do a character on Pony? And I said, are you kidding me? Sure. She said, and so he said, it's kind of a villain. He's kind of a jerk. I said, I do jerk. <laughs> that might not, 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 that might not have meant like you expected. Exactly, exactly. I'm sorry. I, so, so have, has, but I also have this voice here that I just came up with. No. So have we lived up or down to expectations? Up, ah, absolutely. Lived up. <laughs> People are beautiful. I, I'm just so enjoying meeting every one of you. So yeah, let's see, let's, uh... it's a wonderful, wonderful thing, and it's an honor to be a part of the show. All right, so I'm thinking, especially <laughs> the message of it is so important. I mean, this is this is where we examine bigotry, see where it comes from, and 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 can, and you know, it comes from ignorance. It comes from fear. And it really, you know, Naysay is just a, a fearful character. You know, he's just yeah. scared of the different. And thank goodness he becomes, you know, he, he changes his ways by the end of the, the Am I spoiling her for anybody? I'm assuming everybody here has seen every episode of Pony, so I hope it doesn't spoil her. But, All right, so let's, let's do a lightning round. All right, lightning round. Lightning round of some of, the, uh, of some of the wonderful, wonderful voices you've done just to, you know, remind people of the incredible, incredible range oh, in your career. Well, so let's, uh, right. let's start with one of my personal favorites because I'm the one interviewing you. Okay. <laughs> the tick. You mean the evil midnight bomber? What bombs at midnight? Oh! Bad is good, up is down. Yeah, baby, yeah! That's the guy. <laughs> that was a, that was actually I when I did that it was right after Kinnison died. And so that was my little tip of the hat, my little tribute to Sam for the evil midnight bomber. I was also the deadly bulb. Oh, uh, whose whose real name was Pig Leg, because they had a pig for a leg. <laughs> And I had was I can't remember the name of the character, but he was a dolphin in a fish show. I was not able to remember that either. Yeah, I know. And so he was yeah, I, he but his voice was based on Kirk Douglas. Much like father from Kids Next Door. Yeah. Zootopia. Zootopia I played a guy who was a, you know <laughs> I, I, I love icing people. <laughs> but now I've retired and I've opened the bakery and the only icing I do is on cakes. I was Mr. Big, that's right. I'm freaking out your brain. Skunk butt rug. You know how many takes it took for me to say skunk butt rug? <laughs> I kept messing it up. <coughs> you try it. Say skunk butt rug. Everybody, right now. <laughs> you guys should be in voiceover and I should be <laughs> That was very good. Little role in the uh, Rick and Ralph movies. Oh, yeah, sure. Take a look, Ralph. I don't know. They don't keep a lot of medallions. But I got a few in that box pack there. Yep, you were the tapper. Yeah. Root beer tapper, yeah. <laughs> uh, what are some that people might, might not know so well? Okay. Don't feel it. Conceal it. Woo! Don't let it show. These gloves will help. I was the king in Frozen. Um, oh, let's get some disenchantment going. Hmm? Disenchantment? Disenchantment, I played Prime Minister Oddball. Yes, who's got a, a particularly dark side to him that you'll find out about in season two. <laughs> <laughs> And uh, who, does, it, does anyone here remember The Critic? Anyone? Oh, yeah. Anyone? Yeah. 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 Can you give us a few voices from The Critic? Because you were a lot of Well, for one thing, on my, I was, I was, uh, I was uh, Jeremy Hawk, who was The Critic's best friend, Australian movie star, sort of amalgam between uh, 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 Paul Hogan yeah. and Mel Gibson. And so, yeah, that was, uh, in fact, <laughs> Jeremy Hawker hosts a Saturday Night Live show and turns out he does a terrific Johnny Carson. Gee, I wonder who they got to play that. Um, and there was also Shackleford the butler. Good afternoon, adopted Master Jane. Um, and I did almost all the celebrity impressions in the show. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And like particularly Orson um, Welles. Yes, I did do Orson Welles. <laughs> Rosebud. Rosebud. Yes, rosebud frozen peas, full of country goodness and green penis. Wait, that's terrible. <laughs> I can't believe I said that. I'm leaving. All right. Just
just a handful for the road. <laughs> what luck, I found a French fry in my beard. <laughs> what about Mrs. Pell's fish sticks? Mrs. Pell's fish sticks. Even better when you're dead. <laughs> Any last uh, favorites? Oh, gosh. Um, uh, uh, gentlemen, XYZ. Captain Picard and their flies were all down. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> all right, kitty wings. Unfortunately, <coughs> so that being said, um, I wonder if we could get a command performance by the great, great uh, Wakarati. Oh boy, uh, just a quick one. Let's hear Also the narrator for that. And now the great white rotating. <laughs> Watch all their stuff, but there's one thing. They do paint the theme song to Pinky in the Brain as a torch song. <laughs> yeah. And it's the, the, the vocalist, um, uh, I think her name is Michelle Gongli, Ganglia, Ganglia. She's amazing. She's beautiful and her voice is fantastic. So yesterday at the script reading, you mentioned that uh, Pinky keeps getting control of the Trump bot. Yes. <laughs> Is Brayden the one doing the hirings or the firings? Of course I'm doing the firings. I must weed out the chaff from the grain, my friend. Yes. <laughs> Basically, it breaks down like this. If Trump has done something you like, it's me. If not, it's Pinky. <laughs> So uh, back to Pinky in the Brain, um, what was your reaction and, and uh, also the reaction of the rest of the cast when they decided to bring in the Elmira character? I'll be honest. I'll be, I'll be brutally honest with you. I was like, oh, this is, this is not going to work because Pinky is the, is, is the stupid one. We can't, we're going to put him in the middle. Elmira is stupider than Pinky. And, you know, so it's going to be, you know, it, it sort of threw the balance off for me. I love Cree Summer. Cree is one of my dearest friends. We had the same manager for many years. I absolutely love her. I just felt the show wouldn't work because it upset the chemistry. Um, I was actually delighted with the result. I think it still plays. Um, and for Brain to have two protagonists, two annoyers, actually gave me more chance to be that curmudgeon thing that I love doing with him so much. Plus, Tim Curry, Andrea Martin, uh, uh, Jane Wheedlin, I mean, these people in the cast. It was, I would never have met those people with the Elmira in the brain. And it's, it's, it was wonderful. Thank you. It worked out. And it's time for the last question. I think it's very appropriate that the last question come from Raul Duke. Yes. Thank you. Okay, so uh, as we know, we're nearing the end of the fandom. Oh, not the fandom, the show. Um, you've had a con. Don't you dare! <laughs> we have to do a con in 2020, you know. Yeah. Okay, so basically, uh, the show's ending soon. Um, there is talk of G5 coming out. Um, would you ever consider maybe doing some guest roles in G5? Absolutely. I, I would be. I'd love to do anything to be part of this universe and Please work do. with these people again. Yeah. They, they're, they're marvelous. Uh, the creatives behind this show are tremendous. Yeah. I would, I, would be, I would be back in a heartbeat in the New York Center. Thank you. No problem. Thanks for everything. Thank you. So, ladies, gentlemen, those in between, thank you for spending an hour and a bit with myself and, well, much more importantly, with Maurice Lamarche. No, no, not equally importantly. Thank you so much for being a wonderful interviewer and for doing this whole con. I mean, this is really a wonderful experience. We thank you so much for what you've done. Thank you so much. Very much. Cosplay contest in 15.